Hello, everyone. Welcome to another show of uh, episode of Risk On, Risk Off. I'm your host, Brian Hunt. And today, uh, we're going to be talking really big about systematic risk. Um, as we know, our show is, covers a lot of topics of risk. We kind of get some granular, specifically in the world of construction and real estate development. But obviously, those are just two sectors of the economy. But there's bigger risks that can apply not just to the commercial real estate world, uh, but also to the entire country as, as a whole. Um, what we sort of refer to as systematic risk. And let's just sort of walk it back a little bit. I think everybody, let's call it 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, maybe just thought about the risks that were maybe right outside, inside your fence line, is an, whether it be your individual organization. You think about, well, what happens if my building burns down or, or bad flood occurs, that kind of thing. And, you know, getting insurance to pay for that and make those sort of, uh, you know, financial transfers of risk, and you're good to go. But, you know, with you say the old adage of, you know, the globalization and the world got a lot flatter, as Thomas Friedman wrote in his book, things that started happening on the other side of the world could have impacts on your operations as well. And as many of you know, I used to work uh, FM Global, we used to travel the country and the world, and we did a lot of assessments of our clients to try to help them understand what their exposure might be if something went wrong, you know, loss of building, key supply, but what we really started to see back, you know, 20 years ago, 25, 15, some of these losses were really getting big, but what we call time element or dependencies, where if a supply chain was disrupted in Thailand, how did that impact your ability to get a, you know, your final part out the door? And so with globalization and the concept of just-in-time inventory, we were pushing the envelopes as far as, well, we're getting cheaper, it's just in time, but what was the exposure if, by doing some of these things? And I think we've all sort of realized in the past five years, if not more, those exposures that happen or events that occur on the other side of the planet can have immediate ramifications on your, on your world. And it seems like, if not from my perspective, that the world's gotten a little riskier, for lack of a better term, where it seems like things that uh, we took for granted or maybe we were just being negligent about are popping up more frequently. And I think we can run down the list as far as you know, obviously COVID breaks out in China. And so obviously COVID pandemic spreads throughout the world that impacts us, obviously here, but also impacted supply chains out of China. War in Ukraine, Russia invades Ukraine. I think a lot of people, especially in the construction real estate world, found out a lot of key parts and materials were coming out of Ukraine and they didn't have a plan for that disruption. And I think we all can maybe talk about war stories we've heard or companies we've been worked with that have been, you know, subject to ransomware or, um, social engineering at your firms based upon what's going on with cyber attacks and everybody's concerned they're, they're going to lose their job based upon artificial intelligence. And so there are a lot of things out there that can maybe go bump in the middle of the night that maybe in the past five years ago, we weren't paying attention to and we should have, but there's definitely things that could go all wrong now and in the future we need to pay attention. And especially one of those being climate change. And as many, of you probably know, I, I like to read a lot and I came across this book, that I really, immediately I heard about, it, I wanted to jump right into it. And it's called, if you can read this, Age of Danger, Keeping America Safe in an Era of New Superpowers, New Weapons, and New Threats. And so kind of scary, but I think it sort of hits the point that we took it for granted a lot of things 10, 15 years ago that have maybe come up to bite us in the butt a little bit. And the world has definitely changed as a result. And so the question is, how do we, as a nation, address some of these risks and perils and how do we need to change our mindset from a cold war mentality or as the pentagon wants people to say like generals are fighting the last war how do we prepare maybe for the next war or the potential threats that might occur and so i've these jump this book was written by two gentlemen and i'm very pleased excited to have one of the authors here on the show and that's mr tom shankler and Tom, wake, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be here. And your introduction certainly set the stage just perfectly. You mentioned you're concerned about things that go bump in the night. Yes. Well, I want to apologize to your viewers in advance. If you read my book, it will literally keep you up at night. So Yeah, I got to tell you, man, I kind of made a little scared. <laughs> right. But but you you characterized it perfectly for so long. You know, our, our oceans kept us safe. Uh, the threats moved slowly at the speed of wind. Then of steam, 
than of fossil fuel. And now things are coming at us at, at you know, internet speed. And yeah. we, we can't hold back climate or pandemic, let alone traditional nation states. So whether you're in the business community, the policy community, or just a school teacher or firefighter, uh, the threats out there will affect your daily life. Amen. So Tom, obviously we want to dig into the book and, and some of the message you want to go about to, but let's, you know, I might spend a little time on your background because I think it's a very fascinating background. And so, uh, you know, Tom, and before we can start that, I always a little sort of question I have and like, you know, it's sort of the take on the old game, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? So where in the world is Tom Schenker today? Yeah, I'm, I'm zooming in from the Washington, D.C. area, where I've made my home since uh, a decade overseas in the 90s. I've lived in, in D.C. since 97. Um, well, like we were talking offline, uh, D.C. is actually one of my favorite towns. Um, my wife and I, before we got married, she was transferred and she was a reporter in, in D.C., um, and so we've done a long distance and so I'd, I'd be in DC every other month for uh, about a year and a half. And I do always enjoy it. Um, um, I find it a very walkable city, very in interesting city. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a gem. It's, it's a gem. They, they can do a better job with the roads and stuff. But that's a whole question of how Congress gets involved. But <laughs> No, that, that's something too. And people don't realize that the D.C. area, you know, a lot of big cities, like I, I lived in Chicago twice and other places, a lot of the major urban areas, it takes you two hours to get out of town. Yeah. D.C. is so concentrated. You can be at the Appalachian Trail in a couple of hours. You can be at the Chesapeake in a couple of hours. You can do great kayaking 15 minutes from the White House. Yeah. So the greater D.C. area, if you like the out of doors, if you like nature, is absolutely a gem to use your correct word there, Brian. Yeah, and you know, not to go off, the metro system makes things so much easier. And I gotta mm -hmm. say, it's it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. So, Tom, let's talk about your uh, this kind of you know young man growing up. Where'd you grow up, and where'd you go to high school and college, and how that start? Yeah, I grew up in Oklahoma of okay. all places, uh, but became interested in journalism at an early age. I always wanted to be a, a newspaper reporter. Uh, went to college in Colorado. Uh, came back in my. First full-time newspaper job was night police reporter for the Daily Oklahoman in my hometown. Man. Knew I wanted to get overseas, so I broke the piggy bank and uh, went to graduate school in the Boston area, a place called the Fletcher School, where I studied Burgess. strategic nuclear policy, international mm -hmm. law, and all that. Mm -hmm. Got hired by the Chicago Tribune, and for all of my fancy education, my first job there was once again night police reporter <laughs> <laughs> because they want to be sure you've got the chops. And then I spent... Uh, three years as uh, Chicago City Hall Bureau Chief, a very exciting place. And my editors figured that if I could cover the Cook County Democratic machine, then the Communist Party of the Soviet Union would be a breeze. And I moved from Chicago to Moscow for five years. Wow. Uh, spent two years covering the war in Bosnia, uh, then was based in Berlin before coming back to be Tribune foreign editor at a time when the newspaper industry was just collapsing. And that when I was just so fortunate to get hired by the New York Times in 97. And I spent uh, 13 years as Pentagon correspondent before clawing my way to middle management, Brian, and becoming, <laughs> becoming an, an, an editor. And yep. now I'm at George Washington University, where I run a thing called the Project for Media and National Security. And I want to come back to that project meeting, but let's go and circle back for a second. So sure. Fletcher School at Tufts, a phenomenal school, especially for the dealing with international affairs and foreign affairs. Did you know you're going to Tufts? That's what you wanted to do? Or did you sort of stumble into foreign affairs? Uh, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a correspondent. Okay. Starting in high school and college, I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. Okay. Uh, and so I knew that to get from the Daily Oklahoman overseas was a, was a, a stretch. I, I say often to journalism classes, the skills I learned as a night police reporter, you know, get the story first, but first get the story right. Mm -hmm. How to ask questions, how to take notes, how to show empathy and strength. Those skills, Brian, carried me through my entire career. So that was a foundational old school journalism experience. But I knew I had to get some graduate studies if I wanted to jumpstart my career and get overseas faster. No, actually, I, I would piggyback off of that. You know, I spent some of my time um, a forensic accountant. I'm a CPA. My, my goal was to go to the FBI. I didn't work out the way I wanted to. Um, but, you know, I was I did forensic accounting and, for, and like doing fraud investigations and, right. and having the ability to do an interview and understand where how, the ebb and flow of a conversation to try to get what you want. But I, I find that has been beneficial to me in my life. I'm dealing with you know, consulting and working with my clients or prospects. Mm -hmm. um, that 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 interviewing skill, I think, is is very Tremendous, and I think it's beneficial to any occupation, it seems like. 
Right, right. Very, very true. Yeah. So um, and just before we get into the deep woods, um, anybody, if you're sitting here watching the show and you'd like to have a question for Tom, if you look in the bottom uh, right hand corner, there is a spot there where like, it's next to my oval next to my name. Please type in your comment and uh, I will pull up in the fact as long as it's appropriate and for families, I will bring it on and for Tom's uh, observation and commentary. So so Tom, tell me, let's talk about specifically what is sort of the, the project for media and national security and what, what's it all about? Sure. So after 24 years at the Times, I was pretty exhausted. 13 years, as I mentioned, I was going in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan, deploying with front frontline troops. Wow. And, you know, I, I just, even though I was still in my early 60s, I was just ready to retire. But I really messed up retirement. I was unemployed for five days before uh, George Washington University offered me this amazing job. I, I run something called the Project for Media and National Security. What we are, Brian, we're kind of an a, an antidote to fake news, an antidote to polarization. What I do, I convene senior national security officials, mm -hmm. Defense Department, military, Intel, NSC, State Department, Capitol Hill, to come and sit for an hour with journalists on the record. I moderate it. I'm wow. sure all of your viewers here have watched enough White House press conferences to know they're important, they serve a purpose, but they're theater. People act up and yeah. act out. And so my, my pitch to these officials is you come and sit with me for an hour. You'll have a calm, thoughtful, content-rich exchange with the best national security reporters in town. They'll benefit from your information. You'll benefit from, from their stories. And uh, that's what I do for a living now. Tom, well, I got to say right off the bat, I think that's a fantastic service you guys are trying to do because, um, unfortunately, we all know it's very our politics have gotten very polarized and it's gotten very theatrical. Um, and quite honestly, there are people who have been elected that you wouldn't give an you know, entry level job <laughs> and, and, you know, the Dairy Queen um, making big decisions from a national security standpoint. So that to have sort of a rational co collegial conversation, but you know, knowing that you exchange ideas, I think is tremendous. And I think that's sorely missed in, in this current political environment. Mm -hmm. So, so Tom, let's kind of rewind for a second. So, you know, before we talk about the, what you're seeing in this book, and I, I read the book and it's, it's phenomenal. And I, I really you. recommend it to everybody. But you make a great argument, I guess, and I made allusion to it. You know, the, the, say, the old saying the Pentagon's fighting the last war. Um, and then you make, you make this comment in your book. Um, let's kind of rewind to where we stood, you know, the Cold War. I remember I was in college, Southwestern, 88, 92. You know, the Berlin Wall started to fall. I mean, the, the Iron Curtain started to fall. A lot of liberation in Western and Eastern, Eastern Europe. And there's maybe the concept of a, a peace dividend. Um, take us from there to where we got to be today and what did we do right or wrong to get us to this point? Right. Well, thanks. It's a wonderful question. So, you know, you're right. The Berlin Wall fell. Uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. Brian, one of the greatest professional experiences of my life was being based in Moscow in August of 91 when the failed coup against, Jorba, uh, against Gorbachev completely unraveled the, the Soviet Union. Yeah. I mean, this, uh, uh, you know... Uh, this regime power. I mean, it's funny. People say it was a communist regime. It really was just the most successful organized criminal group in world history. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they owned 11 time zones. Uh, they had, you know, satellite uh, constituent countries all around them. And it came unraveling in just a couple of weeks. It was a real lesson. Uh, who was it? It was either um, Churchill or Hemingway or somebody who said, how do you go bankrupt slowly and then fast? fast yeah. Well, well, how do autocracies collapse slowly and then fast? It yeah. was unbelievable. I was there. I saw that. And the sense of euphoria and of happiness, as you say, the peace dividend was palpable. Mm -hmm. And what the U.S. and the West got right was guiding Germany to reunification, trying to guide a Europe to be whole and, and free. And what we got wrong was we considered Russia to first be like us, that it would be a straight and bumpy path to democracy, mm -hmm. not realizing the country was never wired to go that way. The people were not wired. Its history wasn't wired that way. But we convinced ourselves we don't need to worry about it. At worst, it's upper volta with, with rockets. We took our eyes off first Yeltsin mm -hmm. and then off Putin. Mm -hmm. And so Vladimir Putin, in our book, we describe the threat hiding in plain sight. Yeah. If you looked, you always knew who he was, a former KGB thug. If you listen to him, he was always expressing designs on Georgia and mm -hmm. Ukraine mm -hmm. and other countries. So how could we be surprised when he invades Georgia and Ukraine 
and threatens nuclear weapons against other countries. So we got that wrong. Um, we also were so surprised by 9-11. You know, people say, why didn't we know about the Al-Qaeda threat? Well, one of the points we make in our book is that when you say the government didn't know, well, who in the government didn't know? There were thousands of smart experts who had specialized in, in Al-Qaeda, but their warnings didn't reach the top with enough fierceness, with, with enough clarity to prompt the, the correct action. Yeah. 9-11 was a terrible day. We all know where we were. And that, again, our initial response was correct and proper. We went into Afghanistan to throw the Taliban out, mm -hmm. to evict Al-Qaeda. Al but then we stayed on that counterterrorism Zoom for too long. Once bin Laden was killed 10 years later, the country should have reoriented to adopt a broader definition of national security. Instead, we, say, we stayed on the counterterrorism Zoom so that we didn't pay enough attention to China yeah. or to the host of other threats, Brian, that you so correctly alluded to. Climate security is national security. We're only realizing that late. Data security, um, germ pandemic security, food security, for, for goodness sake. You know, you can see the Russians are using Ukrainian grain as a weapon of war. That's at one extreme. And then at the other is either a naturally occurring blight or one made by bad actors could literally wipe out the grain supply in various countries in one harvest. We're not ready for any of those truly existential threats. So we spent too much time and too much money in a Zoom-like focus on terrorism. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would, you know, I think hindsight 2020, but I think if you look at the history, um, you know, 9 11, I think, you know, obviously the, the neocons took that opportunity to, to um, nations change Iraq, which I think we've all, you know, I think, you know, it's still 20 years later and it seemed like the biggest winner out of that thing was Iran um, as far as their influence in the region. Um, but to the point is, I think we, you know, like, folk, to your point, we were bogged down in two areas without looking at the other areas. And I, I think we want to take that trend. Let's take that part. So I want to go through each one of your chapters and kind of talk about sections. And I think let's, with that, focused on Iraq, Afghanistan, we're diverging resources, terror, ideas, this worry about terrorism rather than the next threat. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about one of those threats you highlight in the book, which has been something I've, you know, I talk about a lot of people is um, China. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about how China sort of maybe benefited from that vacuum, at least, or our inability to, we, got, we took our eye off the ball. Sure. Well, you know, to use a construction analogy, because I know you're very active in that world, you know, while we were circling the strategic cul-de-sac of Iraq for all those years, mm -hmm. we weren't thinking about China. To be sure, every president came in and talked about a pivot to China, a reorientation to China, but that was words only. It wasn't in action. Mm -hmm. And my, my writing partner for this book, Andy Hohen, He's now the senior VP for research and analysis at the Rand Corporation. Uh, in 2001, yeah, it's a, yeah, he's the brains of this outfit. Yeah, Brian. Work at the Rand he's, Corporation. he's the brains of this outfit, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and thanks for laughing at that bad joke. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So Andy tells this just goosebump story. Um, in 2001, he was the deputy assistant secretary of defense for strategy. What a cool title. Yeah. And, and, and he wrote a new national defense strategy for Rumsfeld and Bush 43. Guess what that defense strategy called for? Reorienting to, to China. Hmm. They were going to release that mid-September. We all know what happened on September 11th. Hmm. And the order came down from on high. Everything is focused on terrorism. Yep. And Andy recalls being in meetings saying, but what about China? And he was told, well, we have 20 years to, to, talk, to start thinking about China. Yeah. And that was 23 years ago. Wow. So, Tom, I remember looking back upon that. Maybe people say it was a good or bad thing, or maybe it was just inevitable. I remember the whole the, the argument as far as allowing Russia into the WTO. Um, and whether or not, looking back, was that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, I can see... Now, I, I think you, you, I've heard, you know, letting WTO, but it's still, even to this day, I think they're classified as an emerging economy, which I think is, you know, a, a joke. But at, when you had, a, we all thought about it, and I still think maybe there's some argument to it, that you take an economy like, was, you know, communist based or, you know, you know control based, put some free market aspects to it, hopefully grow a middle class, and a middle class as a result would want more change and therefore maybe liberalization of, of the world. 
obviously taking all those people out of poverty, I think, is a beneficial thing in the sense that, you know, you have less people starving and having a, a stable middle class with economy. Having a stable middle class is better than having a unstable and disruptive economy. But with that, how they, you know, in other books that were written on this recently, as far as the whole concept that, you know, you want to go to go China, great, you're a JV, but you're sharing your technology with the, with the Chinese, local Chinese. <sighs> We have we kind of almost like allowed this. I mean, I guess I say allowed this. I mean, the country was going to grow, period. But the question is, was the path we've taken in hindsight the proper path? Mm, that's such a good question. You've certainly explained the argument. Our our response to that is that hope is not a strategy. Yeah, that's true. And I, and I know you've heard that before. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and in the entire decision under the Clinton administration to let China ascend to World Trade Organization membership was based on a hope exactly as you described it, Brian, that entering a rules-based, beneficial, financial, global machine would somehow change the leaders of communist China into being, if not Jeffersonian Democrats, at least stakeholders in a law-based world order. Well, hope was not a strategy. Our hope foundered on the reality that, that China is, uh, is led by, by brilliant clever, diabolical, self-interested communist leaders, and they use WTO for their benefit. As we can see every day, they are not stakeholders in a law-based economic order. Um, yeah. And uh, there's a book came out recently, I maybe read it. It's called um, The New China Playbook Beyond Socialism and Capitalism by K.U. Jin. I'm probably butchering her name. I apologize. Ms. Mm. Jin. Um, but she makes an argument, which I really like. I've always thought, because really you're thinking about China, it's it's really a corporation hmm. in the sense that, you know, it's not really, it, all the mayors have a lot of autonomy and control, but they're trying to move their way up and they want, in, in order to the mayor, they got to make improvements and, you know, big projects and hopefully get their work their way up the corporate ladder for lack of a better term, because it truly is a, you know, especially now with Xi, it's a one person state. Kind of right. thing. He, doesn't, he doesn't like necessarily people disagree with him or he's not really looking for people's opinion. He's going to be his opinion, which I think is a different take. So with that case, I mean, do you see China? Is it a friend? Is it an enemy? Is it a frenemy? Is it, it is it the Newman to our Seinfeld? How do you see China? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not going to go there on Seinfeld, although, <laughs> okay. although that will probably keep keep me awake tonight. <laughs> um, you know, China is described here in Washington as the pacing threat. Okay. Uh, it's the one we have to to watch. Yeah. There are still areas of possible cooperation. I mean, China is interested in economic stability because its economy is so important. But believe me, it will put nationalism first. It yeah. will put its status in the world first as a superpower might. I get that. But China doesn't play by the rules. And I love your description of China as a corporation. Just like I say, the old Communist Party of the Soviet Union was an organized criminal family. Well, fair enough. China is a corporation. And, you know, it gets to, to so many levels here. You know, WTO allowed China access to our markets, our technology, our, our wisdom. You know, people often ask about cyber, and I'm sure we'll get to that later. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, people, uh, the metaphor used to be, oh, we need to prepare for a cyber Pearl Harbor of adversary turning off the lights or mm -hmm. shutting down the banking system. Mm -hmm. I think cyber Pearl Harbor has already happened. Yeah. And it was the silent, stealthy theft of American intellectual property by China worth trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. I mean, it's not an accident that China's newest stealth fighter looks exactly like ours. Yeah. Now, I want to come back on cyber because uh, another book I read was, which you might have read it too, is um, This is How They Tell Me the World Ends, mm. Cyber Weapons Arm Race. That one put me, that one, yeah, that made me scared. We'll get to that later. <laughs> so, sure. So, so um, but now let's pivot to, to Russia. Um, tell me, you know, in, in to your point, as far as like, I mean, I think you're spot on as far as you know, things like Georgia should have give us a head clue what was going to happen. Um, and one of your peers in this marketplace, um, Peter Zion, has been talking about this for quite a while. I think he pretty much nailed on the head. I mean, as, as like Peter Zion, I think he made reverse. He's like basically it's a mob with a gas station. I mean, what is, is in, especially with the, I mean, what I find perplexing about Russia is that, you know, like I think even Ian Bremer says they're playing the bit hot hand, they're playing the best hand because they got the future doesn't if you look at demographics, I mean the future doesn't look too bright for Russia where a declining population and it's such a big location, you got very sparse people per acre or, or however you want to call it. 
I mean, what is your take on the current state of Russia and where this might end up? Right. I mean, you're, it's just, you're talking about life expectancy. I mean, people say, uh, you know, Putin foolishly ordered this war and they said, oh, does he have cancer, long COVID, whatever. Putin's been talking about recapture, recapturing Ukraine, mm -hmm. which is an independent country, but in Putin's mind is part of greater Russia. He first been talking about that since 2007 to 2008. He invaded Georgia in 2008. Don't forget the first invasion of Ukraine, 2014. Mm -hmm. And the one last year was just his, his mo most recent attack. So he is obsessed with, with somehow in his own mind rebuilding this greater Russia, even if that includes sovereign states. And yeah. so what is he dealing with? You're exactly right. Declining population. Uh, they are, you said, uh, a mob with a gas station, mm. upper Volta. Peter's with, the eye Peter's yeah, the eye yeah. yeah, I mean, upper Volta with, with, yeah. with, with rockets. I mean, yeah. it's a superpower because it has nukes and, and a lot of territory. I, I read somewhere its economy is the size of that of Texas. I mean, yes. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a superpower only because of, of, of its weapons and because it has a diabolically aggressive leader who literally could upset the world order and is trying that every day. People often ask me, are we in a new Cold War with Russia? I tell them, we're not in a new Cold War with Russia. Russia is already at war with us. Mm -hmm. And if we don't realize that, our policy is not going to make the right decisions. And when, again, I'm an apolitical person. I'm not going to advocate Democrat or Republican. But when people in Washington say, oh, why are we fighting in Ukraine? Why are we giving them money? Hey, we're not fighting in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. The Ukrainians are exactly. fighting yeah. in Ukraine, and they're doing that for all of Europe and for us. And if we can't give them the weapons to stand up to this global bully, then the penalty will come to us. Well, I tell you one thing, if anything, I mean, it was a blessing. I mean, but, I mean he totally underestimated how NATO was going to respond on that. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, 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 there was concern about NATO falling apart, which is irrelevant. But now it seems like it's found its relevance right mm -hmm. now is keeping this guy out of their, you know, their eastern borders. Because, I mean, I think to your point, I think he, given the option, he's taking the Baltic states back. He, I mean, he's take yeah, he's, he's going to go back to the Fallujah Gap. He's going to protect his land. Because I think when I, it's historical that, you know, I've read prior, like there's a whole concept of this land. I mean, it's having land as a buffer between them and the West. And that's what the, the whole point of you know, Poland and the Czech Republic was, is mm -hmm. a, a buffer between them and the, and the, and the homeland. Now he doesn't have that buffer anymore. He definitely wants it back. Um, right. You yeah. know, and, and you're completely right. He, he suffered a colossal diplomatic fail early on when Finland and Sweden advocated for joining NATO. The yeah. alliance is stronger. That said, like all dictators, he's a clever guy. Mm -hmm. And now there's this new, I don't want to use the phrase axis of evil. We can call it club of bad guys, whatever. Yeah. He's closer to Iran, which is supplying him with drones mm -hmm. to kill Ukrainians. He's cozied up with China because the enemy of my enemy is my, my friend. Mm -hmm. And now he's getting, of all places, weapons from North Korea, one of the poorest countries on the planet Earth, but also one of the most overly militarized. Yeah. Putin's taking artillery shells from North Korea to kill Ukrainians. So Putin is playing a weak hand very well. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a way to put it. And then it almost, it seems a sign of desperation almost if you're having to get deals from North Korea in order to get your, 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 your artillery. I mean, that's, that's mind boggling in a, in a sense. Right, I mean, we, we certainly want, wouldn't want to join that club, but that club is providing Putin with a lot of stuff that he needs. And just as a historic footnote, we're also talking to South Korea about getting some artillery shells for Ukraine. Yep. So it, it, so it's it, it's just we too are trying to like, you know, check the cupboards around mm, the world. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Be, because nobody would have thought that there'd be a war in Europe that would use use up the global supply of artillery shells. Yeah. Who would have thought? Looking for spare change in the sofa, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking Ooh, about. Great. <laughs> I love your metaphors, Brian. You are you are like a metaphor machine. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> so if you've joined us late, uh, if you have a question for Tom, look in the bottom right hand corner, you see my my picture in the, in the oval next to it. Please go ahead and type in your question there and I'll I'll bring it up. And as long as you keep it uh, family appropriate, I'll bring it to Tom's attention. So so Tom, let's go to the next chapter. And this is one I think um, you know, this everybody's I think obviously we all got in the teeth three years ago, um, disease, mm -hmm. pandemics, you know, obviously 
um, pandemics haven't been, it's not something new, you know, uh, the Spanish, you know, and actually, I mean, and this is just a, I've had people told, heard me say this, years ago, five, seven years ago, I was at a um, disaster recovery conference, you know, it's real, you know, fun um, <laughs> for people in my line of work, does that, does economy management. And I remember specifically there was a head of uh, infectious diseases at Yale Medical School of Medicine was talking to us about pandemics and specifically the flu. And Spanish flu, by track, mutates every 78 years. And we were talking, they were talking about that, the potential pandemic that occurs in, you know, so people in this industry have been talking about them. I don't think we as a country gave it any lips, just lips or, or cared. And the thing is that still hasn't, the, the mutation of the Spanish flu hasn't happened yet, we're overdue, but all along, a long way came COVID. Um, and for all of a sudden, like, you know, people in my line of work, we were talking about this, but it seemed like the nation as a whole just didn't, eh, it's never going to happen. You know, how do you plan for something? Blah, blah, blah. Well, I think we all found out real quick. We didn't like, maybe like terrorism, we weren't prepared for it. And Tom, I'd better get your, like, what's the future look like as well, based upon what you've been studying. Yeah, Brian, that's such a good point. And you are out there in the early warning part of society in your work. And Andy and I, five years ago, we, this book has taken us five years and so two years before COVID, when we were doing our reporting, we did a lot of it over the dinners at our favorite Lebanese restaurant near the Pentagon. All right. And at the end of these conversations, whether, the, whether our interview uh, subject was military, defense, intelligent, state, whatever, we'd say, okay, what's the threat we're not thinking about? And 85, 90% said a health crisis, a pandemic. And so the people you heard speak were saying the same things to us five years ago, yep. yet nobody was listening, nobody cared, and we weren't ready. And to me, the, the sad thing is on 9-11, 3,000 Americans perished, and yep. any death above zero is a tragedy. Yep. But, the, but the Bush administration declared it an existential threat, launched two wars, spent trillions of dollars. Well, let's not forget a million of our countrymen and women have died to COVID, a million, yeah. Yeah. the numbers rising, and we never went on anything like a war footing, not that, so use that as an analogy, but we, we never went on a national mobilization, nor even agreed on policy. And so I fear that the institutions are better off. I think Operation Warp Speed showed us how to set up a standing health task force, yeah. but I'm afraid that politically, our country is so divided over everything, including masks and pandemic. And if I could just, you know, cap that with one thought, yeah. the, the two people who love our political polarization the most are Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. and President Xi of China. They yeah. love our polarization. So yeah. if our biggest enemies love how stalled we are politically, that's a problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that point I'm gonna, for my next transition when we come to digital. And I, I want to just back for a second. Sure. Because what's fine, what I've always found this is my opinion. The whole concept of the vaccine thing debate, I just found perplexing because if you study your history, polio was a massive thing. And people were fair, like scared of their kids coming down with polio. And there was, it took years to come up with a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you know, my father's uh, twin sisters, she's, she got polio when she was a kid and it's come back later in life, you know, as far as her, affecting her body. And so I mean, I just can't think, and that, if I was in that, knowing the history of like a pandemic and something like that, and there's a vaccine that can prevent you from or your kid getting it, and we've done this in the past, I guess it's my part of like it's the whole how we've got to this point where I mean, people weren't happy to jump on an airplane if they didn't design or engineer, they more to do it. They'll drive a car, they didn't design it, and they didn't they'll do it. But when it comes to a vaccine, Somehow they think they know more about it than other people, even though they don't have any background in this in this concept. And it's, I mean, I think I, I just love maybe your comment on that. But if, I'm going to take that and transition into digits, and as far as how Russia and China might have played with part of that. So. Right. I mean, again, I try to be apolitical. So when I say I believe in science, yeah. that definitely puts me in a political camp because you know, <laughs> climate deniers, yeah. science deniers, they're usually in one party and one extreme wing of the party. So yeah. I really want your listeners to know. I'm not here to advocate that you vote Democrat or, or Republican, but Understood. just yeah. just vote with your brain. Yeah. Look at the facts. I mean, one of the saddest things is for, for decades, this country could come up with a bipartisan foreign policy. 
People might argue over tax policy or schools, but when it came to keeping our country safe, there was this thoughtful middle, Democrat and Republican. I mean, Nunn Lugar, Senator Levin and Senator Warner. These men and women are just heroes to me because they, they put aside their parties and said, okay, Democrat, Republican, let's meet in the middle to keep our country safe. We don't have that anymore. Yeah, I mean, remember those stories. I mean, like, I mean, Tip O'Neill would rip into Reagan and then like, you know, Reagan would call him like, hey, what's that about? Well, you know, yeah, let's get a beer later. I mean, it's this part you did, you know? It's just like there was still some collegiality to it. And it's, right, like, you it's, are. We are definitely missing that. Um, so to that point, digits and <laughs> the concept of, you know, because I think part of this concept, you know, as far as you just mentioned, you know, Russia and China seem to really enjoy our ripping each part. I think obviously, you know, their manipulation of social, I mean, social media and, you know, the Russians are very good at it, um, have gone a long way. And so I guess for me, social media and digits, I mean, I've seen it personally and not to get too specific, but my daughters you are know, now 21 and 25, but they grew up when Instagram was, was the thing and kids were talking. And, you know, I don't think any of us really maybe understood how corrosive these social media platforms can be especially on the youth where they don't necessarily have the filter. And then you understand just how, you know, if a bad nation state actor wants to put their thumb on this scale, just how powerful that, that technology can be against our society. Right. I mean, everyone we talk to really predicts that the next presidential election will see a proliferation of deep fakes, AI generated fake news that is very difficult to discern even yeah. for thoughtful thinking people. Tom, would you explain, like, I mean, what deep fake really means? Give, give, I mean, I know what you're talking about. I like to hear the audience kind of give a, a good example. Sure. Of so pick either a politician that you favor or one that you oppose. Mm -hmm. A deep fake generated by, by AI can make that politician, you know, confess to murdering babies. And it will look absolutely like they're at the podium in the Senate. Or conversely, you can have them say anything that they want. They can produce statistics and video of activities that are completely fanciful and fake, but they look so good. Now, there's a long history of this. I mean, yeah. Stalinist Russia used to white out people who had fallen out of favor and you could always doctor photographs, but deep fakes are absolutely or nearly perfect and difficult to, to discern. And we've seen how fake news goes viral a deep fake photograph story image statement could do catastrophic harm. Yeah. And if I would say anybody's listening to this, you want to see proof of this, you can go to YouTube and find there was someone who did this. I don't know how he did it, but she goes to deep fakes that basically oh, put Governor DeSantis face and image and voice on an episode of the office space where it was like Mark, you know, you know the Scott, the, the own office banner. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't then, it was DeSantis. In, 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 especially if you're looking on your small phone, you'd have a hard time telling me it's, it wasn't him. So that's the kind of what we're talking about. Um, but as far as digits, I mean, that's where we're, we're talking about social media and AI. This is really kind of one of the areas I think, you know, probably puts a lot of fear in people, maybe rightly so. I mean, especially I think in my industry uh, for social broke, I do think there are inefficiencies and there's ways that AI could be disruptive and maybe make it better. But I'd also say, you know, if you don't get ahead of the curve, you're going to get run over by AI. But I think it also could, it could disrupt a lot of sectors of the economy, but also I think it could be, maybe from a national security standpoint, be even a bigger threat. Right. I mean, technological change is scary, but irrelevancy and redundancy is even scarier. Yep. I mean, look at the global food supplies. I mean, you know, every time a new evolution in agriculture came along, you know, from humans to horses to tractors to gigantic farms. I mean, we produce more food now than ever before because of technology. And we're still vulnerable, but that's important. The debate over AI to me, Brian, has kind of been misguided. When the big story broke last year, it was all about, will AI do my kids' homework? Will AI write a symphony? Will AI tell me to break up with my dog? Will AI, <laughs> will, will AI replace law clerks? I mean, okay, those are fine questions, yeah. but they're not the big ones. When you get into the national security space, when you have weapons coming at us faster and faster, like hypersonic missiles, mm -hmm. which China has tested successfully, mm -hmm. which Russia is building, mm -hmm. they come at us from areas where we don't have defenses. All of our radars and defenses are pointed over the pole for an attack from the Soviet Union. 
China's hypersonics can attack from anywhere, and it's possible that someday, we would, and they come at hypersonic speeds, just like a cyber attack. You might have to trust an AI system to protect us, but how do we keep humans in that shooter and sensor cycle mm -hmm. so, we, so we don't surrender? And I'm not even talking about Terminator kind of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, there's a real world example. I'm sure all of your uh, viewers know that we've sent HIMARS air defense systems to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. This is a truck like device with missiles that can shoot down incoming missiles. Well, there's no human who can spot a, a Russian missile and on his iPhone or Abacus calculate trajectories fast enough. So yeah. HIMARS has AI already. But okay. it's been tested and tested and tested to know a missile from a civilian airliner. And so far, it's worked very well. But if you take that to the next generation, at some point, and this is a valid concern, will we surrender control of catastrophic weapons to AI? Because not to do that means they won't be used in time. Yeah. And that's a really tough question. No, no. It, it's um, like you say, technology, once it comes out of the bottle, it doesn't go back in. Right. And so then, you know, obviously we know the adversaries are, you know, putting a lot of time and effort into AI. And so I'm sure, you know, me as a nation, maybe cognizant of AI and figure mm -hmm. out how we're going to use it to our benefit, but also try to realize how the, the other side is going to try it against us. Right, right, yeah. true. No, it's, 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 it's a very much a big unknown, that's for sure. But sort of tied into that, which you talk in your next section of the book, is drones. And obviously drones have been very disruptive on the battlefield of Ukraine because it's amazing what the Ukraine's been able to do in taking out some pretty expensive uh, machinery with just a, you know, a drone. Um, I mean, but it's, it goes beyond just warfare. I mean, it's but also what can be done from a, you know, some of ill intent could easily make, you know, cause a lot of damage on the homeland if, if someone with a, with a drone. Right. I mean, I'm actually pleased, although surprised that there hasn't been more drone activity here. Uh, you know, a drunk chucklehead mm -hmm. landed a drone on, on the White House a few years back, mm -hmm. completely non-malign actor. He was a chucklehead, but yeah. a drone landed on the White House, right? Yeah. Yeah. If that had been during a, a visit by a, you know, senior foreign leader, can you imagine the, the disruption? No. You know, I don't want to give ideas to bad guys, but they're already yeah. out there. You could fly a drone over the Super Bowl and completely disrupt a major event, even without malign intent. And if you had malign intent, think of what a drone could do. Yeah. There, there are systems in place, but it's still very much a patchwork of jurisdictions, who can do what, what's a national security event, what's for local police, who has the technology. And we simply, the, the Biden White House is trying to stitch together a bunch of rules, building on some things that came before. But, but if a malign actor wanted to disrupt the Indianapolis 500, the Super Bowl, the World Series with a drone, um, they have a high opportunity for success. Yeah, and it's, I guess we're all kind of waiting for the, um, the future of drones. I could, you could see you know, drones being used for delivering groceries or your, or, your, or your pharmaceuticals rather than have to go to the office. And you could see there's benefits from a not having it in your car and maybe you know, retailers don't need that much square footage. But then to have all these devices running around and then you got a whole stream of, of drones flying over the head and then one of them decides to go rogue or someone's like a nefarious intent. I mean, how do you, I mean, I can see the problem as far as how do you track and make sure which one's the good one and which one's the bad one? That's the, the challenge. And there are technological fixes, but yeah. a lot of them go to privacy because drones are controlled by Wi-Fi or cell phones. And you currently have to have a warrant to, to like tap into somebody's cell phone. So they're trying to work out legal authorities to let you take down a drone short of violating, you know, um, personal privacy and all of that. And you're, you're such a master of metaphor and an analogy. And I, I just say that our chapter on drones is more than just the specific drone threat. It's about the leakage of technology. Yeah. Because after 9-11, the U.S. had an absolute monopoly on drones. And now we see Ukraine building them, yeah. you know, North Korea's fielding them, terrorists are, and they're, they're being made out of cardboard. So you can't track them on on radar so this is a an american Whoa, we got drones being made out of cardboard now yeah absolutely oh god yeah i guess that, that makes sense but golly i didn't see that one i didn't hear about that one right right and and so they're made out of cardboard and composite materials so they're much harder to, to see than wow. a metal engine and all that yeah. so so that chapter is about the threat of drones which we're deeply concerned about but it's also the the the, the, the metaphor of 
lost technological advantage. Yeah. And I'm going to be cognizant of the time here, Tom, but I, I want to make sure we get this last chapter, which I think is sort of a overarching that covers a lot of this thing. And that is just you know, storms and, or climate change. Um, in my line of work, uh, I tell people, you know, you may not believe in the climate change, but your insurance carrier does. Um, and we're seeing that already in the sense that I'm going to steal that line. Yeah, please perfect. go right ahead. <laughs> please go right ahead. Brian, really, you are you are like all, all of a sudden my favorite metaphor and analogy creator. Well, I pre spread the word, sir. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, but like, I mean, you're seeing that in the sense we've already seen cares, you know, especially on residential, like State Farm, all state leading the state of California. You're seeing, you know, cares leaving Florida because they can't afford make it affordable. Um, wildfires is, is a tough coverage now, like in New Mexico and Colorado. Um, it, it's definitely shifting. And to the point, there was even an example, this is, I'll set the stage and let you talk. Earlier in the year, there was a story in the New York Times that developers on South Beach were not going forward with their projects because they couldn't get insurance because they were too, because based upon where they were, too close to the water, in projecting to the future, you're looking at more either rising tides and inland and more water penetration with the high, you know, you got more frequency and higher, um, stronger hurricanes. I mean, you're not, you're not, there's no constitution. You don't have a constitutional right to insurance. Right. And so that, if anything, I would say the insurance world's probably going to be lead the charge on some of this, be more resilient if um, governments won't do it. Well, I mean, that's, you're, you're completely right. And I, I was not aware sort of of the insurance piece because we're yeah. looking with the national security level, but yeah. for, but for every, the everyday life, Brian, you have nailed it. And the point we make is, you know, climate security is national security and it affects your pocketbook, where you can build, where you live, quality of life. I mean, we had smoke warning days here in the mid Atlantic because of the Canadian wildfires. I've lived yeah. here since 97. First time that's ever, ever happened code red days because of wildfires mm -hmm. in another country, mm -hmm. hundreds, if not thousands of miles from here. Yeah. And, and the way it affects national security is, for instance, the National Guard, our citizen soldiers, has deployed overseas with our brave combat troops for every war in America's history yeah. because we don't have a large enough standing army. Guess what? They are unavailable for the future because they're needed at home for wildfires, floods, hurricanes due to climate change. So yeah. they're off. You mentioned builders in Florida. Well, guess what? How is the Navy going to find enough money to raise their major installations at Norfolk and Coronado and mm -hmm. elsewhere? There isn't enough money in the Pentagon budget, you know, and those bases are going to be underwater in, in, in coming decades. What do you do about that? Yeah. In researching the book, I learned that the Pentagon is the world's largest consumer of fossil fuels. Our Department of Defense uses more than any other institution. I can see that. Yeah. Yep. And as the air gets hotter and wetter, it's going to need more fuels to establish the same lift. Yeah. No, that's that's a very good point because that was actually just, I saw that in, in um, it was a story that was posted in Dallas Morning News, but it was reposted from Bloomberg about how major, major airports around the world are having to redesign their capacity. And to that point, if it's hotter and wetter, you need, especially like a big, say, big 737, if it's full, you need a longer runway to get that plane off, or you got to have fewer people in the plane, therefore less revenue to the airline to get off the, which I, is, is that like, wow, that sort of blew my mind. Right, right. right. And, and so apply that across all the tens of thousands of military yeah. aircraft around the world. The hundreds of thousands of civilian aircraft will have to use more fuel to achieve the same left or make the changes that you said. And, and as long as the United States sustains its role as a leader of global security, yeah. We're going to have to mitigate the problems of climate related mass migration and the world and the, the World Bank is estimating that millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people will be on the move in coming decades out of Asia, out of Africa, mm -hmm. moving toward the developing world because there's no water or food owing to climate change. And how are those societies going to deal with it when here in our beloved U.S. we are tearing ourselves apart? over the immigration question. No, that's a great point because I had the good pleasure of having Tom Barnett on this um, show a couple Brilliant months ago. Thinker. Brilliant. And, he, and his book comes out in two weeks, but he specifically hammers on that point as far as you talk about like his like, the equator and 30 degrees above and below, it's going to be less and less inhabitable as far as water failure crops. And I think in down in here in Texas, we're already seeing that where this mass migration we're coming out of, it's not people coming from Mexico. Mexico as a economy is actually doing relatively fine. It's actually right. negative back to Mexico. Right. It's coming out of Honduras, Guatemala, 
that area that was just failed systems and failed crops and in, in, in rising temperatures and flooding is just it's making it harder for people to live. That's and exactly right. They're, and they're coming our way. And right. I, and, 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 and so let's take the left, right, red, blue politics out of yep. it. <clears throat> These are facts. People, mm -hmm. the world's getting hotter. People in, in that 30 degree zone you talked about are going to have less food, less water. They are going to naturally come to places where there's food and water and jobs. Put aside your politics. What are we going to do about that? Yeah. And so that's a great point. Maybe we got our respectful of your time here, Tom. So like now we've, the book is phenomenal and it addresses all these issues. So then what's the next step? I mean, and I, I think part of your book is to sort of redesign the whole, as you, as you talk about the, the infrastructure as far as, you know, you know monitoring and then re responding to an event. So what is in your, in your, your partner sort of suggests what or the, the road forward? Right. I think people will be surprised because Andy and I are totally inside the Beltway creatures, guilty mm -hmm. as charged. But, but, we, we, but we believe national security policy is too important to be left to Washington, which is why, Brian, I was incredibly honored when you reached out to, for the, this, this podcast, yeah. uh, because, you know, you and your audience are the people. I mean, you are engaged. I can tell you're deeply engaged in the risk question. People in the business community should be. Yeah. And so Andy and I, even though we're beltway creatures, we're not advocating a bigger de defense budget. We're really not. We want the money we're spending now to be spent wiser. And, and so we come up with a pretty good, modest proposal. Not a new institution, not like the big muscle movements after 9-11, mm -hmm. but we want the U.S. government to replicate Operation Warp Speed. You know, it started from zero, mm -hmm. got a vaccine in a year unbelievably great, great work. The military too has these things called, you know, standing joint task forces, right? So we want standing joint interagency task forces, one for climate, one for food security, mm -hmm. one for health security, mm -hmm. data security, and so on. Not new hires or new institutions, but bring people from all of the parts of government as we did for warp speed, who have an interest and who has skills so that when the next crisis hits, it's not a pickup game and a standing start. They should get together four times a year. Yep. They should exercise. Yep. Everybody's numbers in their speed dial. So whether it's pandemic, climate catastrophe, giant data breach hacking, it's not like, oh, who at the FBI do I call? Mm -hmm. Who's that guy at DHS? Mm -hmm. I met at a conference. Mm -hmm. Get together four, six, eight times a year. Practice. Get to know each other. Get the supplies on, on hand. Yeah. And just be ready because the future, it's a cliche, the future is already here, Brian. Yeah. And everything you just said, there's the fundamentals of what we talk about as far as disaster recovery plan and business economy management. You don't wait until the event to come up with your plan. Right. If anything, in quite honestly, with to your point, you develop the plan and you train your people. When I see when the event occurs, you don't even look at the plan. People are trained. They know the roles and responsibilities. It's like even I think in Eisenhower said, as far as your know, plans are nothing, it's it's a preparation of everything. Yeah. So no, I, I totally agree on that. And I but I think it's 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 such a hard your line of work and, and what I my as far as dealing with clients and trying to think, it's hard to get people and I don't think it's just this country, I think it's throughout the world. People have a hard time perception that, you know, I'm 25 and I'm gonna turn 65 some days, therefore I gotta start saving my retirement on my kids' college. It's it, it, it's it, sometimes people have a hard time grasping the future or that you need to plan now for the future. Right. I think too much, we live too much in our short term memory or ADHD, whatever the case may be, but you know, we just don't conceptualize the need to take a little time and plan for the future because it's, you know, we say you want to plan for the worst and hope for the best. You don't want to get caught flat footed. So, right. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you from the, the business world, I can tell you've been way ahead of, of, of these issues. You better be careful. They're going to yank you to Washington to run one of these. So I, I, I will serve Rome if Rome calls me. <laughs> I'll we'll be a good patriot. Yeah. Um, Tom, I've got to, you know, we're going to cause this time and obviously Tom, very appreciate it. So Tom, so let's, what do you do when you're not writing about national security issues or thinking about that? Uh, my wife and I are avid hikers and kayakers. Hmm. Uh, we used to be avid cross-country skiers, but with global warming, uh, there's, I mean, we used to be able to ski in Virginia and West yeah. Virginia, and yeah. there, there's just no snow anymore, yeah. uh, which is really, really painful. Yeah. Um, I love music. I'm, I'm bad at it, but I play mandolin and a little piano and a little flute, yeah. but again, badly, badly, badly. You got a favorite and, style? What, you, like, you like pop? You like G yeah. jazz? What do you like? Yeah, I mean... I. I grew up on rock and roll, of course, okay. and jazz. But okay. right now, in my older years, I'm really into a genre called Americana. It's yeah, sort okay. of the, you know, it, it's out of the bluegrass world, but it involves 
folk and a little country and of course jazz rhythms. It, it's yeah. sort of like it's Americana because it's just every kind of music in, in America. Very good. And uh, so you're a DC uh, native. So if somebody's looking about coming to DC, what's um, your favorite restaurants? Where would you suggest someone go? Oh, that's an easy one. I, I can't advertise by name, but I'll tell you. Okay. People get mad. Um, DC, like New York and other cities, has all these expense account restaurants. Very expensive, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Stay away from them. Stay away from them. Mm -hmm. DC has amazing ethnic food. Truly uh, does. Central American food, Thai food, Indian food. The neighborhood ethnic places, really inexpensive, really, really fun. Whether it's Adams Morgan or Alexandria or DuPont yeah. Circle, yeah. Uh, yeah. Capitol Hill, just go to the, the ethnic places and just have a really good time. When I mentioned earlier, my wife and I, we did a long distance dating when she was a reporter uh, for the Legal Times. She lived in Adams Morgan, so yeah. spent some time in there for sure. Right. Tom, hey, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for accepting the invite. This has been a pleasure. Um, it's a great book. I strongly recommend everybody go out and get a copy. Um, and obviously, I've got it on my Kindle, and it's, it's wonderful. And I've, I'm able to highlight sections and turn it into posts on my LinkedIn post. Um, and then, um, again, it's called Age of Danger. Keeping America safe in an era of new, new superpowers, new weapons, and new threats. Tom, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Brian, this was an absolutely fantastic discussion. Really yeah. interesting and di dynamic. Thanks, thanks for having me. My pleasure, sir. So, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that uh, episode. Like he said, you know, there's risks that seem to be percolating left and right. You know, we probably didn't think about 15, 20 years ago, but we should be now. And who knows what the future looks like. But the whole point of this conversation and having people like Thomas is that you have to stop, assess your business, your country, even your family. You know, what are those threats that go beyond your fence line? I mean, not to say insuring your house or insuring your property, understanding you got your, your IT backup all good. But like what could impact you on the other side of the country, other side of the planet, whether it be labor efficiencies, or labor supply of labor, supply of material, how could a disruption of something in the Suez Canal impact your ability to get product out the door or service your clients? Um, how exposed are you to IT disruptions? We talked about you know, a little bit earlier, Tom, as far as you know, we're, worst case scenario, if, what happens if you know, we all mentioned in Texas you know, a couple of years ago, power is out for five days. And so how would that disrupt your operations? We, a lot of people learn the hard way. And this is the whole point is to think about your situation, assess it, and come up with reasonable plans to mitigate it. Um, whether it be your business or as a country, you know, what you have today and what we have today is not necessarily what's going to happen in the future. And if anything, we talk about the, you know, climate change, um, you're going to buy a house. You certain you're going to have water 25 years from now. Cause like whether you're saving for your retirement or saving for your kid's college, the future is going to come at you. It's going to come at you fast. And so the question is, you think about where am I going to invest and build a company, build a, a house, a home, a family, do the resources you have now, can you be certain you're going to have them in the future? And that's the whole point is this, is thinking about your risks and making informed decisions. So once again, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, if there's future people, topics you want me to cover, please send me a note. You can post that on, on LinkedIn or uh, send me an email through uh, my LinkedIn as well. Um, five days from now, this, this video will be available to you on YouTube. I'm part of my subscriptions. And then the links will be available also on Twitter and Substack. Until next time, everybody. Bye.